Thank you so much for the introduction and for the, the possibility, the opportunity to present. Uh, let's see if my slides start sharing here. I would have loved to be in Boston for the meeting, but given the circumstances, this really is a great alternative. And I've prepped with lots of fancy snacks. So I'm ready for a nice symposia evening here in Uppsala. So the title of my talk today is Genomics of A and Fungi. Uh, in my career, I started out working with ectomycorrhizal fungi and got increasingly interested in uh, like the, the large unknown uh, groups of fungi, like what uh, Tim will be talking about later today, like the Arterhizomyces that we worked on and where we are able to culture some of this unknown diversity which is challenging in some ways, but I was always convinced I would never work with AM fungi because they have seemed way too difficult to work with, but you have to grow them with the plant. And um, honestly, when you work with metabarcoding, like I've done a lot, you kind of believe they don't even exist because using standard protocols and standard primers, you can hardly detect AM fungi in many systems. But uh, about 10 years ago, I ended up working in Bloomington, Indiana for two years and with the deciduous forests there, my interest for AM fungi grew. And I also started collaborating with Jim Beaver and learned more about this high levels of uh, variability in our DNA genes in AM fungi. And I found that really intriguing and interesting. Like this example here, it's from uh, Teresa's work, um, but they showed uh, based on uh, large subunit uh, sequences within this uh, clade outline in red there, the Claridioglomus, all the species had two highly diverged uh, types of ribosomal genes. And they exist in all the strains. And then if you go into one of them, like the tree to the right, the S variant there, there's still variation within that variant as well. So to the degree that you cannot distinguish species using this marker the way we would with a lot of other fungi. And we know how this uh, high level of polymorphism in the RDNA genes, and as well as in other markers, uh, in combination with the multinucleate asexual spores of AM fungi, this has led to a, a long and somewhat overly heated debate about uh, the genome organization of AM fungi, whether they are heterokaryotic, like have lots of nuclei, different nuclei within the same organism, due to the fact that uh, there's no visible stage where they have only one nuclei in their life cycle. So this led people to think they could have accumulate variation in this way. Or the opposite, the homokaryotic model where all this observed variation would be found within the single nuclei as ploidy or as multiple copies. So the debate uh, has been intense, but it's sort of settled down now. Uh, because uh, knowing like figuring out this polymorphism was really hard before we had uh, genome data. And it's only uh, now in 2013 when the first genome of an AM fungi was published. And uh, it's the Rhizophagus irregularis, the model fungi that's um, uh, used for a lot of experiments as well as genome work. And this figure here is, illustrates the papers published on AM fungal genomes. There's a gray line uh, that increases, it's the number of species sequence, and there's a yellow line showing the number of genera represented uh, by these species. And we really learned a lot from these genomes. Overall, the genomes are fairly large and have a high number of predicted genes, in, in particular when compared to uh, separatrophic species like um, Mucor and Motriellas in their sister lineages of the AM fungi. And there's no evidence that it's uh, an effect of genome duplication, but rather um, the sizes seem to be driven by expansion of repeats. And you see that the repeat content, it varies a lot, but it ranges from 20 to up to 86% there in the Gigaspora margarita. So this, it depends a lot on how you define and identify repeats, but it's, it's a big content in most of the genomes. Uh, on the other hand, when people do estimate the variance as SNPs per kilo basis, uh, the numbers are fairly low. So the uh, variance, intergenomic variance in that sense is fairly low. In the case of the Rhizophagus irregularis, uh, there are several strains 
available genome data from several strains, and this has allowed for comparisons. So in a Shen paper from 2018, they estimated that around 50% of the genes were accessory genes, meaning that they're found, uh, not found in all strains. And they, they also found that these accessory genes could belong to any predicted functional categories. So it's really between strains, there's a lot of variation in the genome content of uh, isolates. They ascribe this uh, high variability to the high number of active TEs in the genome, suggesting that uh, TEs move things around and copy things around, and that this has been a reason for the observed uh, genetic polymorphism previously interpreted as heterokaryosis. My favorite paper uh, for AM genome papers is really this one, Brian Maida and Cole Walkers from 2018, because they demonstrate why we have this high level of RDNA polymorphism in AM fungi. We know that in virtually all eukaryotes, the RDNA gene is organized in a, a, of an extensive tandem repeat. So mutations that occur in one copy will be effectively removed during meiotic recombination. So in the end, that within a species, variation is very low, but between species, the operon diverges, particularly in non-coding regions like the ITS that we use for, as markers for species in barcoding studies. Um, and this, this is exactly what makes the RDNA gene a, an excellent marker for barcoding, but obviously not for AM fungi. Because uh, what Maida shows is that in Rhizophagus irregularis, there's no tandem repeats of the ribosomal gene. Instead, there's 10 or 11 non-repeated copies that are spread on different contigs in the genome. And these uh, copies evolve independently. So that's why you can find, even within a single spore, there can be many different variants of the ribosomal genes. Of course, we have no evidence yet that this is the case in all AM fungi, but given the high variability, it's fairly likely that that's what we're going to be seeing. Another really exciting finding in AM genomics is the work by Ropars and her colleagues. It came out in 2016, but they identified the mating type lead in AM fungi. Uh, again, they used several strains of Rhizophagus and found that in two strains, so if you look at the allele frequency, two strains had a biallelic uh, distribution with the peak at 0.5. In these two strains, they also found a dip in coverage in one contig and could locate the mat locus there and found that within those strains, there were two alleles. Whereas the other four strains that they examined had a, the opposite uh, allele frequency distribution and only one mating type allele in each strain. So based on these observations, they outlined a possible life cycle for AM fungi, with the clonal cycle where uh, strains having only one mating type would propagate clonally. And then if these two strains with different mating type met, they could fuse, form a dicarion-like stage with two mating types. And then maintaining those nuclei at a 50-50 ratio within the mycelia. We don't know how that would be organized, but that's what the pattern of the allele distribution it looked like for the strains. And it's likely that uh, the cycle would also include uh, karyogamy at some point uh, with the possibility for meiotic recombination, but this stage has not yet been seen and the evidence that we have for recombination are, are still thin because it's really difficult to identify uh, recombination events with this, uh, in these organisms. But uh, it's a likely part of a cycle like this. So I don't think anyone really doubts anymore that AM fungi have a sexual cycle. But the question really is how frequent is, does it happen in relation to the asexual reproduction of these fungi? So like I said, we really learned a lot from the genomes uh, that have been published. But it's important to remember one thing that almost all of these genomes come from auxanic cultures where the fungi can be grown with the uh, uh, transformed roots. Uh, the exception is the diversity spore at the year, which has this little fruit body structure above ground with the red, red arrow. So that was used for getting enough uh, DNA. Uh, this year, another sort of an AM fungi was uh, also published. It's uh, Eusephon piriformis, but instead of plants, it's associated with uh, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria, nostox. And uh, 
it belongs to the same phylum or subphylum, depending on how you like it. Given that, given its host, I think many of us expected that Yosephon would be a basal sister to the AM fungi. But uh, that's not what it looks like based on the phylogenomic analysis using uh, transcriptome data that's available. To me, really, this paper, the best part was that the authors went back to the location where this species was known from and managed to re-isolate a strain. That's really impressive. And they could culture it and get enough uh, uh, biomass for uh, uh, genome sequencing. But that really is the key problem with AM fungi a lot. It's hard to get enough biomass for DNA extraction. And that's where our work comes in. So we recently released a preprint uh, in BioArchive, the paper is still in review, uh, where we present de novo genome assemblies and uh, phylogenomic analysis, including 18 previously unsequenced taxa, representing eight new genera of AM fungi. And we generated these without exenic cultures. So instead we started with whole inoculum that we obtained from Invan, and we extracted spores from the soil with sieve and uh, sucrose gradients, picked the spores, crushed the spores, stained the content for DNA, and then uh, put it on a, a fax uh, cell sorter. And at the facility, we could sort individual particles uh, into wells. And then we amplified the DNA, we could score if DNA was fungal or bacterial or both. And then we picked the ones with only fungi, sent them for sequencing with Illumina Isaac X. And uh, all this was possible th thanks to Claudia at a single microbial single cell facility and uh, Barbie Ellis, who was postdoc with us, as well, of course, of Messi Montlianerin, who was a PhD student who led the work. But let's take a step back, uh, because this uh, is part of a a large ERC project that I started in 2016 with the aim of studying evolutionary stability of AM fungi. And you realize that's an impossible, it's a huge task, but it's uh, very interesting to dive into. At the time, I had built the idea on this model of a temporally dynamic heterokaryosis model so that different nucleotides existed, they segregate and they re emerged by anastomosis. So that was the main idea of the project. And the thinking was that we would be able to determine if nuclei were different by sequencing them individually and comparing them. That sounds easy enough, that's what I thought. And I started with claridiglomus because we knew, like I was saying, that there was high variation in the RDNA genes, so we figured there'd be other variation as well. Uh, so we wanted to generate reference genomes and then map reads to the individual nuclei. And when I started, we had already done pilot experiments showing that we could sort the nuclei and amplify them. And I kind of thought that would be the hard part. But uh, it turns out that it's, uh, when you get the sequences, it's very easy to assemble it to something that looks like a genome, but then to actually make sure that the assembly is a good representation of the genome. That's a whole different thing. So that's what we spent a lot of time figuring out how to handle this kind of data. So in our case, we had 24 individually amplified and sequenced nuclei that we wanted to combine to an assembly of the genome. We use MDA for amplification, and it's supposedly it's unbiased, meaning that every nuclei will not represent the whole genome, but together, everything should be represented. But using amplified DNA, you have very variable coverage. So you can't really use the coverage uh, for information, and it causes problems with a lot of assemblers, and it's also difficult or impossible to distinguish a repeated region from a uh, highly -like amplified region. So there were several challenges with that. So we ended up spending a lot of time evaluating assemblies, looking for single copy genes, how they, how they were assembled, estimating completeness, the size of the assemblies, repeat content, looking for the RDNA variants, and so on. We worked on this to the extent that we started to call it assemblomics because we had over, I think we had over 300 different assemblies of these same nuclei uh, in when we, in, we, that we published in this work. And it does sound a bit crazy when I say it, but I think it's an important lesson for trying to explore new types of data. So I'm going to walk you through the three types of workflows that we developed and the conclusions we drew from them. So we had all the nuclei and two of the pipelines or the workflows that we did 
uh, started by assembling single nuclei and then putting single nuclei together. So in the number one, we use mazurka to just assemble all the reeds into single nuclei. Whereas in the uh, second one, we use spades, but then we first normalize the reeds, assemble single nuclei and put them together. And we use lingon, a new uh, um, like assembler of assemblies that uh, Manfred developed for this purpose. So in this way, we got whole genome assemblies. And then the third uh, option we had was that we just put all the data together, we normalized it and then assembled it with spades. So we went straight to a whole genome assembly. And this is uh, one of the ways we evaluated it. We looked at Busco genes that we expect to find as one copy and we expect to find 290. So then we estimate how complete are this, the genomes and we have increasing numbers of nuclei. So we assemble one, two, three, and so on. And what we see is that the, the, the single copies is the dark gray, they increase, but then there's a light gray with duplications that start to accumulate as we add more and more data. Let's see. Um, and with the other methods, the assembling with the spades, you can see that the single nuclei, we get bigger assemblies, but as soon as we start to put them together, we accumulate a lot of duplications, artificial duplications that should not be there. Whereas the method three, putting all the data together, we get a higher completeness estimated. Already at six or seven nuclei, we had over 80% completeness uh, of the uh, genomes. So putting them together, we saw that using Masurka, it gave us a uh, very accurate estimate of uh, repeats, uh, whereas the, uh, the, the single nuclei were very fragmented assemblies. And also the complete uh, assemblies were very fragmented. With spades for single nuclei, we get better assembly of individual nuclei, but we really cannot use them for putting them together as a larger assembly. And the third method using spades on all the data. Uh, really gave us quite nice and long context and accurate gene structure. But the repeat context was severely collapsed. So we felt uh, pretty happy with uh, how the assemblies were looking and um, Mercier felt confidence that we would actually be able to use this on a lot of different strains. We would be able to sequence a whole bunch of A and fungi and extract single copy orthologs. That's looked like we were getting genes represented in a good way. So we decided to go for a broader sampling and we talked to Jim Beaver about taxon sampling and I got isolates uh, from INVAM uh, so that we would get uh, at least two representatives from every genus in the collections. And we started this massive sorting effort. We started using pools of spores instead to get more nuclei and we were getting everything from seven to 24 nuclei per isolate. Uh, in the end, there's always some that didn't work where we couldn't separate out particles corresponding to nuclei or we couldn't get a good amplification. But in the end, we had 20, 21 isolates that we could generate assemblies for, and we used this assemb the spades assembly, putting all the data together. And here it is, our uh, file genomic analysis. We were able to use the genomes we generated as well as previously published genomes and get a very good taxon representation throughout the AM fungi. And it's based on 371 single copy orthologs represented in at least 50% uh, of the included taxon. Um, we used mucormucota here as an outgroup based on a previous analysis where we had dicaria included as well. And we recovered the same topology both with RAXML, IQ3, and the Bayesian analysis, and all the nodes are fully supported. So it's uh, well supported. We also colored it based on the consensus taxonomy from the Redeker and co-workers using the IMAM, the colors on the IMAM homepage because it's so nice and colorful. With this comprehensive polynomic analysis, uh, we could demonstrate that all the family level classifications are well supported and they are monophyletic lineages. We found that uh, in contrast to uh, work based on ribosomal genes, the, the order glomerales is polyphyletic. Because what happens is that you see the purple color cladoglum 
Plomarase uh, comes out as a basal sister to the diversis borales and the rest of the glomerales. And in the paper, we go into some analysis of conflicts here on displacement. But overall, the, the picture is a well supported phylogeny with uh, broad taxon sampling. The stars indicate uh, new genomes from our work. And one reason that we can feel confident about these assemblies is that we also included Rhizophagus irregularis, the same strain for which there is a very good reference genome, the version 2.0 that was published by Shannon et al. 2018. So we took the two assemblies, ours and the published reference, and then we compared them. So first mapping reads, we find that 99% of our reads map to both of the assemblies and individual nuclei cover on average 50% of the assemblies. Based on this, we concluded that the reads, uh, like all the genome is represented among our reads that we have generated. Then we took uh, of all the Busco genes that were present in both the genome assemblies, we did linear uh, like pairwise alignments and we compared the similarity and found that there was an average 99.7% similarity. And the background there is that 260 of the genes were identical. Then there were a couple that was like 96 or 98, 99. And then one of the genes had only 60% similarity. But our conclusion is that uh, any random errors that are introduced in the MDA, they don't really, uh, re are not retained to a large extent. So most of the genes really are uh, assembled correctly and uh, well represented using our method. So we felt that this is a very solid method to generate single copy orthologs suitable for phylogenomic analysis. But we're always interested in learning more about what happens with the different assembly methods and what kind of analysis are different assemblies suitable for. So Marisol, who was a postdoc in the project then, she's now moved on to a tenure track position at the Agriculture University here in Uppsala. Uh, she said developed uh, additional modified assembly for the same data set and gone into an extensive comparison. And she will be presenting this work. It includes link copy number, how they are represented, as well as repeat landscape. So he will be presenting them at the CanFunnet later in May. So you can go and listen there if you want to hear more. Uh, I don't have so much time. So I will speak quickly. You're wondering what about the single nuclear assemblies. So very shortly, looking at Clariodiglomus uh, claridium, single nuclei assembled with spades. What we see is that uh, we have a total size uh, that is smaller, of course, than the, the complete assembly. We get the completeness uh, based on Busco that ranges maybe from 20, but even up to 80% completeness for a single nuclei. We detect only uh, one math allele, but we detect it in most of the nuclei. So we assume, we conclude that this is um, similar to a homokaryotic stage described by Ropash. Of the two uh, ribosomal variants, we detect one in all of them, the L variant, whereas the S variant we only detect in 15. Uh, in our conclusion from this is that the S variant probably occurs in fewer copies, so we are more likely to miss it in the assembly. So we're not thinking that it's actually absent, it's more all of the genomes are not represented. We wanted to go into looking at interorganismal variants and map the reads from individual nuclei back to the biggest uh, assembly and see that it supports the idea that these are haploid nuclei. But we also have a sort of a, a part of variance within each nuclei that's intermediate, which we ascribe to noise due to the MDA, and we want to filter that out. So we keep only alternate allele at everything above 0.9, reference allele if it's smaller than 0.1. And then we map across the whole organism. We look at variants and we find again low polymorphism, uh, 0.18 in the coding, and 0.35 in just the non repeat content of the genome. They're mostly rare variants, but really interesting. We find a strong signal for negative selection when we uh, estimate the NDS across the coding, uh, the well annotated coding part of the genome. So this is very exciting, I think, because it's also very much in line with other work from Teresa's group, where they did this beautiful study monitoring, using visualization, monitoring the fate of nuclei in the mycelia and in the spores. 
And what they saw then was that uh, spores populate the nuclei, uh, no, nuclei populate the spores as the spore mature, nuclei move in and out. So it's really not founded by one nuclei. Uh, they saw that in the mycelia, there's sort of programmed nuclei death in the mycelia when some nuclei uh, de are degraded. So we're thinking maybe we're seeing the effect of this negative selection on the level of nuclei. But this is really very early work and we're gonna look into it further. To sum up the work we have, I hope I've convinced you that the single nuclei sequencing can be used to generate good AM genome assemblies. And that after careful analysis of the assemblies, I would say that now this is when the fun begins, that we can start looking for biologically important aspects of the genome content and determine features that are specific to AM compared to their sister lineages. And even more interest maybe diving into within AM variation. Like we're interested in phosphorus transporters, for instance, the diversity of those within those li these lineages. And uh, I'm really excited to start uh, diving into this data and see what we will learn. With that, I want to thank everyone, my funding, a lot of great resources here in Uppsala and a lot of great people to work with. Thank you very much.